Hi. Um, I'll, um, I have to say I'm, I was very impressed by this presentation. It's like a detective story and every basic scientist should really see as many of these as they can because it actually makes you believe that what you're doing could <laughs> eventually help somewhere and definitely gives you an, an extra oomph, I, I would have to say. Very impressive. So I'm going to um, talk about kind of a side project from my lab that has morphed into uh, what we hope is kind of an independent, um, independent uh, way of um, uh, conducting a, a new study. And it has to do with glaucoma. So, um, as you know, it's one of the leading causes of blindness in the world. And uh, the genes are really not that well known. Uh, so people often talk in terms of risk factors. And there are many of them, including race, age, family history, and so on. Eh. But the primary risk factor is an increase in intraocular pressure. And this is also one of the best ways to diagnose this disease. So just to show you the, the uh, relationship, uh, an increase in uh, eye pressure makes it increasingly likely that somebody has, in fact, developed glaucoma. Now, uh, in contrast to photoreceptor diseases, it's often very hard for the patient to tell that they are going blind. And um, <laughs> the, the disease is in the periphery and uh, there is a lot of central compensation and somebody can lose like 30 to 50% of axons of ganglion cells before they start thinking that th there's something wrong with before they go to see an ophthalmologist. So, um, uh, basically, it can be difficult to diagnose. And uh, the problem is also that there is no treatment for the ganglion cells that have, that have been lost. So the best one can do is try to uh, manage the IOP. Um, and so in order to help these people, it is really crucial to be able to detect things early and to treat IOP early. And uh, uh, you, of course, know this very well, how, you know, how the increased IOP arises, but I I'll just quickly mention that lens, in order for the lens to function, it, we can have blood vessels. So um, basically, the way these living cells in, around the lens are fed is through the fluid secreted from the ciliary body and that fluid, ca fluid has to go somewhere and it drains into the venous system through the Schlems canal. Now, if there is a mismatch between the production and the outflow, there is uh, an increase in pressure. And the, the structure that is affected, however, is here. So it's the optic nerve, especially the optic nerve head and the retinal ganglion cells which start to die. So it's action at a distance. It's like somehow the retinal cells can tell that there is a mechanical uh, stimulus going on and, it, it, and they don't like it. So this is a very simplistic view of the retina and all the layers. These are the ganglion cells, which are the neurons that are sending the actions to the brain. And some very kind of uh, quick pictures that I made are uh, this is the retina, and here are the axons that are collected from the ganglion cells going to work towards the optic nerve head. This is the optic nerve head here. You see it's collecting the axons. And another picture is shown here. The, the axons are going into the optic nerve head and then to the optic nerve. And uh, I would just like to quickly mention that the treatment, again, is limited to the anterior chamber. So there are uh, drugs that modulate the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And they are also lasering surgery options, but apparently they have side effects and one would like to avoid them if, they, if one can. 
Now, what about the posterior retina? Uh, there is really, um, uh, th th there has been a lot of controversy and a lot of speculation as to what is killing these cells. And uh, a lot of uh, the mechanisms that have been implicated in into this are uh, sort of glial uh, gliosis and gl production of um, reactive oxygen species, uh, various cytokines, then in, um, infestation with macrophages coming in. Uh, th it has been proposed that the, the blood vessels are getting constricted, so there is a hypoxia happening. But um, uh, some people have sh thought it's purely mechanical constriction of the lamina cribrosa, for example, but really it's not known. And what, um, uh, there have been a lot of studies uh, trying to modulate uh, cell death in ganglion cells, various uh, um, glutamate system blockers, uh, neurotrophic factors, antioxidants, and so on. But basically, it has been stunningly ineffective. So it is as if we, we don't really understand the mechanism through which pressure is impacting these cells. So basically, um, what I'm going to tell you about today is s some thoughts and experiments that we have done or, and trying to convince you that maybe we have identified that point of impact between pressure and intracellular physiology of retinal ganglion cells. So, and that is, uh, I will be talking about the, uh, the general principle of mechanosensation uh, in, in retinal neurons, which has n really not been addressed before. And the, the point is that every cell in our body is in kind of isometric tension state, so it has to feel its neighbors. It's, it's th we have specialized mechanoreceptors which detect uh, mechanical stimuli, pressure, things like that. But in some way, every cell in our body is also a mechanoreceptor because it has to coordinate its activity to its neighbors. And uh, w what we know about uh, kind of real mechanoreceptive cells is that the process of mechanosensation is always associated with in influx of calcium. Now calcium, I won't go into this deeply, but basically calcium is one of those magical messenger molecules which does pretty much everything in the cell. Uh, name a, a cellular reaction, calcium has to regulate it at, it, uh, at some way. And if calcium goes very high because it's so ubiquitous, it basically kills the cells. And it's practically goes without saying that uh, a cell that is undergoing this process of degeneration uh, is going to have high calcium in some way or another. Um, but here, we want to investigate whether the process of mechanosensation itself is associated with changes in calcium. If it is, then when we stimulate the cell in a mechanical way, we should see an increase in calcium concentration. So do they have stretch sensitive calcium permeable, uh, do the retinal ganglia cells have stretch sensitive calcium permeable channels? Now, one easy way to look at these channels is to stretch the cell through hypotonic stimulus. So in this way, uh, water comes in, it stretches the membrane, and if you, do, if you do it too much, the cell is going to explode. But if you do it just a little bit, then you have kind of a harmless uh, stretch. <laughs> and what we do is we take a ganglion cell from the mouse retina and we load it with two types of indicator dyes. One of them is called calcine. And this is basically, despite its name, it's a calcium independent dye that just measures the volume. So if the cell volume is going to increase, the calcium fluorescence out of it is, should go down because it's diluted. Then we put another indicator in. This is called Fura2, and it's a calcium indicator dye. So this dye tells us exactly what the calcium concentration is. So the idea <laughs> is then to stretch the cell, to stretch the cell, and see what happens to the calcium signal. 
here is an example. Uh, this is a calcium signal. We uh, stimulate with a hypotonic stretch and we see a decrease. So clearly we know that the, the cell has, has expanded. Um, and this is a calcium signal here. We stimulate with glutamate, which as you know, stimulates glutamate receptors, which are very, many of them are very calcium permeable. So we know this is a ganglion cell because we see this huge calci uh, glut calcium increase in glutamate. And then when we stretch, we see this very significant response. Now note that this, this is a saturated concentration of glutamate, which is one of the most powerful excitatory molecules in our brain. And look how big this signal is here with a relatively s small stretch. So, um, so we said, well, we have something there. These cells have stretch sensitive channels. And they are in the plasma membrane because when we do this stretch in normal saline, this is what we see. And when we repeat it in the calcium free saline, this is what we get. So we don't see anything. This means that this is a channel which is in the membrane. And now we were able to block it with an ion called gadolinium. And why is this important? This is important because gadolinium is a blocker of a particular superfamily of calcium permeable channels called trip channels. And um, there is another blocker called ruthenium red and it is just as good an inhi inhibitor as uh, gadolinium. So we were pretty sure we have one of these channels. But there are a lot of them and I mean a lot. And th there are several superfamilies and uh, each family has many isoforms and um, all of them are affected by these two non-selective uh, inhibitors. So we made a few bets and we uh, chased several uh, pathways and I'll just focus on one. <coughs> so when we look at these channels, we see that pretty much all of them are expressed in the retina. And I have to tell you that basically uh, nothing is known about this <coughs> channel. It's, it's a very hot top in neuroscience in general, but, but retina really lags behind. And uh, if you <coughs> look in the literature, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty much virgin field, field. There is nothing going on, or very little. So we have focused on one particular element there, uh, um, isoform. It's called TRIPV4 for transient receptor potential vanilloid 4. And the reason why this channel is so interesting is that it acts as an integrator of many different kinds of stimuli. So it's not only mechanical sensitive, and pressure sensitive, it is temperature sensitive. So if you increase the temperature, you will hugely regulate its ability to conduct calcium. It is, it is activated by arachidonic acid, which directly con connects it to the inflammation mechanisms anywhere. And uh, it's, it is localized to kidney and uh, non-excitable cells, but it is very strongly expressed in sensory neurons. Uh, like sen neurons that sense, uh, that regulate our osmotic balance in the body, uh, the spinal cord, uh, those are root ganglion neurons, uh, and also hippocampal neurons. So um, we look for this channel in the retina, and we find the mRNA, and we also find the protein. Now we tried 10 different antibodies, and they all gave us the same staining in the knockout <laughs> and the wild type until we finally stumbled upon an antibody that works really well. So this is the Western blood, this is in the knockout, this is the wild type. And we expressed the gene in uh, hex cells and, and we see a signal with this antibody versus control. And we know the antibody is good because when we look at the tissue that has this channel characterized and we know it's there, uh, we get nice staining and we don't see anything in, in the knockout. So we have, so now we have a way to look at this, where is it localized in the retina? Now, okay, it doesn't translate perfectly, but basically if you look at this picture, you see it's localized to ganglion cells. These are ganglion cell markers called BRIN3A, and they label the cell body of a ganglion cell. And these are the plasma membrane around them. So as you can, can, can see here. 
So we have now identified a pressure-sensitive channel that seems to be very strongly expressed in retinal ganglion cells. Now, this is a transgenic retina expressing GFP in ganglion cells, and this is double labeling, and you see there is a pretty strong color correlation. And the green things here are Miller cells, and I'll be talking about them if I have time later. Now, we expressed TRIP V4 in um, construct, which has GFP behind it, engineered to have GFP behind <laughs> it. So when we stain for GFP, we know where TRIP V4 is expressed. And it's very strongly expressed in ganglion cells. Again, and nothing is uh, in the non-expressing retinas. So, so now, again, ad additional confirmation. When we look at isolated cells, we see the ones that label for ganglion cell markers, but not for other markers, co-localized with TRIP V4. Uh, this is just another example here. You, here, it's difficult to see, but there are literally like 100 cells or more, but only the ganglion cells label with the, the, the uh, antibody. And now, finally, we are looking from the top, and we are looking at a whole bunch of ganglion cells with, uh, with a marker here. This is a ganglion cell marker. And when we look at superposition of the green dots, which is TRIP V4, uh, with the ganglion cell markers, we see these puncta, which are pretty much focused on the ganglion cells. And uh, the puncta are very interesting because they suggest there is a lot of trafficking going on of this protein. So it may be a very dynamic thing, which is something we want to look at in the future. Now, I just wanted to, it's not showing very well, but basically what this shows is that this, the TRIP before is not expressed in GABAergic amacrine cells, which is something that retinal physiologists care a lot. And it's very, it's, it's very interesting because it shows that the modulatory mechanisms uh, are not expressing, expressing this pressure sensitive channel. And um, now, going back to the optic nerve head, which is where the major impact of pressure in, in the eye is supposed to occur. This is, th this, these are uh, ubiquitous sta hematoxylin stain, I think, and so on. This is a st staining for astrocytes, which are feeding the arc axons as they are acting, exiting the uh, retina. And when we look at the optic nerve head, so here, here are the axons exiting uh, the retina, you see it's very strongly uh, expressing the strip before channel. It's perhaps the strongest signal anywhere. So this region, which is exquisitely sensitive to pressure, it's, is also strongly expressing this pressure sensitive channel. It's not, exp the channel is not expressing astrocytes themselves. These are two different pictures. One of them is from the retina the red is GFAP, which is an astrocyte marker. The green is the TRIP V4. And this is from the optic nerve itself. And you see the red and the green don't co-localize. So we know it's not expressing the astrocytes. It's not expressing microglia. So it, again, these are the ganglion cells. It doesn't come through very well. Th these are the microglial cells. And there is no co-localization at all. So this is important because these are the immune cells that are kind of driving a lot of um, um, uh, pathological remodeling in, in glaucoma. Now, um, how about the physiology? When we isolate these cells and we stimulate them with very specific, uh, highly selective antagonists, we see that the huge calcium increases. Um, so, and when we measure the diameters of cells that respond to these agonists, and compare them to diameters of identified retinal ganglion cells to a very specific marker, <laughs> we see that they pretty much perfectly superimpose. So we now have reason to believe that um, uh, activation of this channel is, has, is almost as important as glutamate as far as the calcium levels are concerned. This is how it looks like. This is a photoreceptor. This is a ganglion cell. This is a glutamate stimulation, and this is a, a selective agonist. And this is nanomolar levels. Uh, you see there, there is a calcium increase. And not only that, the calcium increase desensitizes. So the response to glutamate is sustained, but in the presence of this agonist or membrane stretch,
calcium comes down. So this will be important uh, presently. We can block it, again, with ruthenium red and also with gadolinium. So we know, again, we confirm it's a trip channel. And it doesn't occur in zero calcium, just w like with membrane stretch. So we know we confirm it's a, um, it's a membrane channel. And then Daniel, the grad student in the lab, did a very clever experiment. He, the question, of course, was, okay, we have a channel that ex responds to stretch, and we have a channel that responds to very selective agonists, but are they the same? So what he did was he used the ability of the channel to desensitize to then stimulate with GSK to occlude the response, and there was nothing. And when he waited a long time, uh, 45 minutes or something, that's half an hour, he was able to get a GSK response. So we know now that prim the principal channel <laughs> that is making these cells sensitive to pressure is trip D4. Now, th this channel is not there to kill the cells, right? It has to do something in normal physiology of the retina. And wouldn't it be interesting if the retinal cells were actually putting the information about retinal pressure into the spiking pattern that the, they are communicating in to the brain. Wouldn't it be interesting if what we see actually has a pressure component to it? So what we did was we took the entire retina, put it onto a multi-electrode array. That's an array of like 64 electrodes. So we can record from 60 ganglion cells at the same time. And then we stimulated with this selective agonist and what you see, one of the, this one is called 4-alpha PDD, and you see when we apply it, there is an increase in spiking. This is like spiking rate. So this will be like um, 40 spikes per second, 60 spikes per second, uh, in a huge proportion of cells. And in fact, uh, just with this agonist, we see about 60 to 90% of cells are responding. So. Uh, pretty much consistent with our physiology showing that every ganglion cell ha has these, these, these channels. This is the GSK, another one, um, showing that the firing rate uh, increases rapidly after application of this um, uh, agonist and it also desensitizes just like calcium does uh, in our imaging studies. And the, the change in the firing rate is more than 100 fold. So what that means is that pressure is capable of producing an excitatory component that is an integral part of our visual signal in the brain. Now, I mentioned this is also a temperature sensitive channel. We haven't looked into this very much, but we just did one simple experiment where we raised temperature to 37 degrees from 25, uh, 37 is the optimal range of activation for trip V4, and we see an increase in calcium. So uh, it's something we are interested in pursuing further. Now, what does this do for survival of the cells if you stimulate for a long time? One way of looking at this is to do a so-called tunnel assay, which labels dying cells, basically. So if you stimulate them with a glutamate agonist for a long time, the number of green cells, which are the tunnel positive cells, will increase, and uh, this will be a sign of cells entering the apoptotic process. What happens if you do this with this trip before agonist? What happens is you s strongly increase the number of green cells. So this is um, under, um, this is now, GSK with small diameter cells, which would be like photoreceptors and amacrine cells, and there is pretty much no effect, very little effect on survival, no tunnel, tunnel staining. And we looked at large diameter cells, which are ganglion cells mainly, and there is a huge effect uh, of dose dependent effect of this trip before agonist. What this means is that uh, mechanical sensation or just pure trip before stimulation is going to kill ganglion cells if it happens strongly or if it happens for a sustained period of time. And we think this happens because calcium is increased and we would like to test this. In many ways, we have re just received a trip before knockout mice and we want to see if we can prevent like acute or chronic glaucoma uh, um, with, uh, by deleting this particular channel. 
So basically, we find that membrane stretch induces the entry of calcium ga into ganglion cells. They express these channels. They, the channels control spiking. Uh, and if you stimulate them for a long time, uh, you, you can kill them. Now, the story is, so it basically this channel would integrate a lot of different stimuli, not just pressure. So uh, there are arachidonic acid, temperature, os osmotic stimuli especially. And uh, you can imagine that if somebody has a mutation in this channel, they, it could conduct calcium at normal pressure, right? So this would account for like low tension glaucoma, for example. And it turns mm -hmm. out that just last year there have been a flurry of papers in Nature, Nature Neuroscience, things like that, showing that tributary core mutations cause uh, very, very severe skeletal dysplasias um, and uh, hearing loss, uh, visual dysfunction. So. Uh, we are now thinking about doing sequencing from glaucoma patients and see if we can target this channel. Yeah, did you say what, what's the pressure for knockout mode? What, what, do they have any sort of function? We just looked at visual acuity, and uh, acuity itself uh, it doesn't seem to be different. No. Now, uh, 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 there is another thing uh, that I would like to talk about. So I talked about these um, channels expressed in ganglion cells, and what I would like now to talk about a little more is they are also expressed in Miller cells. And the Miller cell is an incredibly important cell in the retina. Some <laughs> often ignored, but basically this cell spans the entire radius and feeds and integrates signals across these layers. Very important cell. And um, if we label it for Miller cells, this is what we see. You see that it's a, this radial organization. And when we label it, double label it with trib before, we see it's mostly in uh, ganglion cells, the green, but there is some yellow here. And this yellow is colocalization with the Miller cell. And, but the Miller cell, responds very differently from the ganglion cells. Yeah, I told you that the ganglion cell desensitizes in response to trib before activation, right? Miller cell, on the other hand, responds with huge calcium inducers, which are sustained as long as the uh, stimulus is present. This would mean that uh, this <laughs> is really the cell that is going to be much, even more sensitive to pressure. So how does this look like? Here is a gang, here, uh, so let's see. So this is, you will see now uh, we add a tree before agonist. And if this resolution would be better, you would see that not only cat serum goes up, but there is a whole bunch of waves going back and forth. And another thing you would have seen, thank you is that this photoreceptor here starts to respond together with a ganglion cell. So when this guy goes up, sometimes this guy lights up. That would suggest that some factors are being released from the glial cell uh, that are impacting the, the, the photoreceptor. Um, so uh, yeah, here are the waves. OK, S thank you. Uh, now. Um, we can block these waves by blocking calcium release from intracellular stores. And I won't go into this very deeply today, but basically uh, it's every cell has ability to store calcium in endoplasm particulum, and it can store huge amounts, right? So basically then it can release them upon stimulation and it releases them through a receptor called rionidin receptor. So the idea is calcium comes in, binds right on the receptor, and it gets this, it acts as an amplifier to release calcium out of the cell. And uh, what we, are, what we uh, are thinking then is that not uh, the reason, one reason why this response is sustained is that calcium comes in through the trib before channel, 
it activates this release and then uh, explodes the uh, concentration in the cytosol. And basically, we find this by, by um, blocking it with a particular blocker of the uh, calcium stores. And uh, this is unseeable, but basically I wanted, this would show that these waves are blocked when we antagonize um, the calcium release from stores. Now, uh, how about the glaucoma? Uh, this is a mouse model with uh, uh, severe glaucoma and you see it's uh, lacking the ganglion cells, which are the BRIN3A positive signals here. And the mRNA for BRIN3A goes down. And we were surprised to find that the trip before mRNA goes up. So because we know these retinas have very few ganglion cells, this means that the Miller cells have <coughs> upregulated the uh, trip before signal. So they are even more sensitive to pressure than they were before. And when we look at the staining, we see now the trip before staining is way increased in the retina and these are the Müller cell signals here. And so we have evidence to believe that now the signal is not only in the Müller cells, it's also, also in the astrocytes. Um, so somehow the regulation is going high haywire. And we are not the first to think about this. This is a paper fr uh, from sensory neurons which they've stimulated chronically with a mechanical stimulation and they found that the mRNA and protein go up when during chronic, following chronic stimulation. So what about other mechanisms? We find that in glaucoma, the, this rionidin receptor which provides a boost, it's like a rocket fuel for the calcium si signaling, is hugely increased. Uh, one particular isoform. Uh, this is, these, this is uh, the chronic glaucoma, these, these are controls. And these isoforms don't change at all. So, and the increase is more um, significant in severe glaucoma compared to early glaucoma. So somehow uh, the cells are interpreting an increase in pressure as, uh, as a stimulus for hypertrophy and augmented signaling. And we find that, so this is how this rionidin signal looks in the wild type. You see that it's mostly in neurons. It doesn't co-localize with Miller cells. It doesn't co-localize with astrocytes. <coughs> uh, it's very strongly expressed in the optic nerve head. Again, no co-localization with uh, glial cells. And this is now in glaucoma. This is control. This is moderate glaucoma. This is severe glaucoma and you see it's very strongly expressed in Miller cells. Um, and <laughs> but what is very interesting now is we see that um, trip before co-localizes with a molecule called aquaporin-4. This is a water channel in uh, that regulates osm osmo osmotic function, basically. So these are, the red are now ganglion cells, expression trip before. The green uh, is aquaporin-4, which is expressed in Miller cells. So basically what this says is that this pressure sensitive channel is right next to a water pore. So uh, what the Miller cells are doing a major function in the retina is to control the osmotic fluxes. So people have been looking for years to actually identify how they do it and we are pretty sure that we know what's going on. And in glaucoma, the um, ganglion cells are mostly gone, but now there is a huge gliosis and huge upregulation of, of these aquaporin channels as well as trip before. So uh, we are start starting to kind of put together some very qualitative models about what is going on. We are thinking that both ganglion cells and Miller cells are intrinsically pressure sensitive. Uh, they, they both respond to calcium, uh, and, but these guys respond in a sustained way and may be able to release all kinds of uh, uh, in inflammatory and s neurotrophic and neurotoxic uh, factors that impact 
uh, and impact the remodeling of ganglion cells. So it's something that we are considering now. Now, I would just like to mention something else and, and finish with that. So we, j just like Dr. Hageman here is uh, thinking about AMD and systemic kind of effects that we have started thinking in the same way. Now, a lot of glaucoma patients are systemic hypertensives. So, uh, in fact, 72%. So, how about TRIB4 signaling in these, in these patients? We just looked in the mouse, of course, and uh, we find a tremendous upregulation of, of this TRIB4 channel in the kidney of, of uh, a mouse with glaucoma, mice with glaucoma. So maybe yeah. there is something, just like Greg is saying, uh, with respect to AMD, maybe something similar is happening in glaucoma in these TRIB4 channels, and we don't really know how to think about that, but uh, are kind of open to suggestions. So basically, we find that uh, Miller cells, but not, not astrocytes or microglia, express this channel. It, it's working by activating calcium waves through uh, the Miller cell, and what that means is now the whole retina can see what's going on because these waves go up and down and up and down. And this, this mechanism is upregulated um, um, during glaucoma and may have a role in gliosis that is a hallmark of, of glaucoma. In the m mouse model that we study, the Miller hypertrophy hap cell hypertrophy <laughs> happens months before the ganglion cells start to die. And uh, th this may be part of some kind of a systemic dysregulation, although that is not clear at all. Um, so this is my group here um, at uh, Utah. And we have very good collaborators here um, uh, around, I mean, around the country. And uh, I would like to thank John Moran Tiger Award, which was basically responsible for us doing this study. My lab is a photoreceptor lab. This is what we are funded by NIH and so on. And we were not experts on ganglion cells at all, but after a conversation with Randy, he said this is interesting and he gave us some money and this is how we came to this project. So, thank you. These mice are hypertensive. Oh, these mice have increased IOP, but we don't have a way to measure the blood pressure. Okay. So that would be interesting, yeah. Yeah, there are some strong signals from the hypertension. I think they're not. Yeah. It's, if we have them, we would measure. Absolutely. Yeah. 